in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Christmas story never gets old, does it? And uh, this time of year, it's a time for all of us often to allow ourselves to do a little bit of introspection and uh, self-examination, don't we? Maybe we go to church, maybe we try to be good and nice, and uh, maybe we feel a little bit like Tommy. Last year, Tommy, during Christmas, asked his mom if he could have a new bike. And uh, so she told him that the best idea would be to ride to Santa Claus. However, Tommy was part of a church play. And uh, he played a vital role in the nativity scene. And so he would prefer to write to baby Jesus. And so Tommy went to his room and wrote, Dear Jesus, I have been a very good boy and I would like to have a bike for Christmas. But he wasn't very happy when uh, he read it over. And uh, so he decided to try again. And this time he wrote, Dear Jesus, I'm a good boy most of the time. And I would like a bike for Christmas. So he read it back and uh, he wasn't happy with that one either. And uh, he tried a third version. Dear Jesus, I could be a good boy if I tried. And especially if I had a new bike. And uh, he read that one too, but he still wasn't satisfied, so he decided to go out for a walk in the neighborhood. And uh, he was thinking about a better approach. And after a short time, he passed by a house with a small statue of the Virgin Mary in the front garden. So he crept in, stuffed the statue under his coat, heard it home, hid it under the bed, and then he wrote the letter, Dear Jesus, If you want to see your mother again, you better send me a new bike. (laughs) So, I have to think that sometimes during the Christmas season, we kind of look inside ourselves and see how we are so short of where we should be. But sometimes we take things in our own hands, don't we? Just like Tommy did. And we... uh, We could possibly look at Christmas like another holiday, another tradition. And I was talking to someone uh, a while back, someone that grew up in church. And they were telling me that now they go to church only during Christmas and during Easter, during the holidays. Somehow their Christianity, and I don't know where you stand on this, um, their Christianity has become nothing but a sociological identity. They're saying, I'm a Christian, is to say, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Hinduist. I'm a Christian. It's a sociological identity and nothing else. And so for some of us, Christmas and Easter are the spiritual moments of the year. And we 
live our lives just like Robbie. Robbie was in front of uh, the pastor coming out of church one day, and the pastor was standing at the door, and uh, he was used like me to shake hands at the door. And so the pastor grabbed Robbie by the hand, and he pulled him aside, and the pastor said, Well, you need to join the army of the Lord, Robbie. And Robbie replied, well, I'm already in the army of the Lord, Pastor. So Pastor question: how come I don't see you at church ex except for Christmas and Easter? And he whispered back, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> <laughs> so for as much as I've heard so many comments like that through the years, it's really funny uh, on one side and yet it's so sad on the other. Uh, People like that are missing out on the best opportunity of their lives. It's almost like uh, they have cancer and they're terminally ill and we're offering them the cure and they refuse it. I'll come and look at the clinic though. I'll check it out. I'll even get inside one of the labs and check out all the procedures. I just won't take the cure. So, what if some of us in that particular mindset have not understood the kind of cancer that we have? What if no one has ever told you or me that the Bible says that we're all born sinners? All of us. And that our souls are eternal. They will last forever. However, our souls will land in one of two places. Either eternity with God or eternity away from God. And what if no one has told us that eternity away from God is going to be an eternity in a quarantine, in a space where suffering will be an understatement, where there will be suffering like nothing this world has ever seen and your body will not be consumed by it. Maybe if we understood that truth, we would want the cure. Maybe if we look inside and saw our insecurity, our need for acceptance, our purpose, that never gets filled, we see that there is a missing piece in our lives that only God can fill. I often use the illustration from Blaise Pascal that said, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. I have come to that place in life where I've noticed the God-shaped vacuum in my heart. And for years I ran on my own, trying to fill it with joy that I thought I could draw from things or people. Have you filled that vacuum? So what if this Christmas is God's plan for us to stop for a moment on our spiritual journey and to look at the signs on the road that are telling us something. What if God had a different plan for you this particular Christmas? And it wasn't about just attending a church service. It was a particular moment on your spiritual journey where God wanted to meet you. And I believe this Christmas could be the beginning of something new and exciting for you and I. There is something amazing about Christmas as we look at the incarnation of God. Christmas says, you're not alone. Christmas said, says, I've heard your cry. And I see the God-shaped vacuum in your heart that I have placed and I only can fill. And I have a solution. I have a plan. And you have purpose and destiny above and beyond what you can imagine. It's my plan, my destiny for you. And it starts with me coming down with me taking human form in a humble way to provide a way for you to have a life that's going to go above and beyond what you've ever seen or imagined. What if that were to be God's plan for you this Christmas? So it's uh, really God's great news to offset the bad news. And as you know, and as I know, 
like little Tommy with a statue, we're sinners. And we have to understand that we were made to have a relationship with God, and our sin does not allow us to do that. The story of Christmas is the good news about what God has done for you and I to atone our sin. To get rid of our sin if we believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, for our forgiveness and our salvation. So today can be a new day for you and I as we understand the story of Christmas. Today we speak of joy, true joy, as we deal with the Christmas story as we just read, specifically the birth of Christ and the joy that that birth really brings to a group of shepherds. So here's the context that we just read together. Augustus Caesar. Do you know who he was? He was the great nephew and later adopted of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was the greatest military general that the, uh, the Roman Republic ever had. Augustus, who was also called Octavian, was adopted by Caesar. He became the first Roman emperor. And he was the one awesome strategist that turned the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire that lasted almost 1,500 years. It's self-destructed at some point. That's what Romans do. They start great things and they don't finish one. Right? I can say that. My wife will vouch for that. All of us Italians have great ideas and sometimes we just on the follow through we just kind of get lost. So Caesar adopted him and decided to leave everything to him. However, another guy was in place, Caesar's lieutenant, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony thought Caesar was going to leave everything to him. So when they realized when Caesar died that he left everything to Octavian or Augustus Caesar, then the two of them went at it. Started a war, then Mark Anthony found refuge in the arms of Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, and Octavian conquered them all. The Roman Empire doubled in size during Octavian's rule, or Augustus Caesar. They, everybody underestimated Augustus, but he was a born fighter. And he clawed his way to power, defeating everybody else. He gave the empire a solidness that was to endure for centuries and turned the republic into the empire. He was the first to be called Augustus. When the Roman Senate voted to give him that title, Augustus means, Augustus means holy or revered. Is that important? Yeah. Because that title was reserved for the gods. The first one to be called a god was Caesar. Now, Augustus was called the son of a god. Because Caesar was called a god. Now that's very important. Why? Because you will find in the Bible that often the Apostle Paul would define Jesus and refer to Jesus as the Son of God. To offset a little bit of the culture of the moment. So under Augustus' rule, that decision came toward making the Caesars gods. So some of the Greek cities in Asia Minor have already adopted Caesar's birthday on September 23rd as the first day of the year. Caesar was a big deal in the Roman Empire. They were hailing Caesar as Savior, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. And there's an inscription that really calls him Savior of the whole world. So, called the Son of God, called the Savior of the world, now you understand why we find reference to Christ when Paul especially speaks to the Greek Gentile readers. So what does he do to organize the empire now really well? Every 14 years he would do a census. And that was both for military and tax purposes. And so each Jewish male had to return to their city, the city of their fathers, to record their name, their occupation, their property, and their family. Mary and Joseph had nothing to declare. I don't know if you've ever gone through the airport you know, through customs. Do you have anything to declare? I got nothing. 
right? And that's really where they were at. There were nobodies from a no town, very poor. You can tell later by the offering that they present to the temple. It was a very poor offering. So, however, Joseph and Mary had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem because of the Davidic lineage on Joseph's side. So a lowly, humble couple, two poor kids, she was probably between 12 and 14, two nobodies from a no town in the middle of nowhere, had to travel 80 miles. She was full term. That is saying, honey, we need to go from here to Orange County on foot. I don't know how many of you have had pregnant wives. Usually you have to even go down just to the station to get milk or get, you know, french fries all of a sudden. You never had french fries before. Well, now I, I, I want french fries. And, and so it's like, can you imagine 80 miles all the way to Orange County on foot? Sometimes we picture in the legend they were on a, on a mule or on a donkey. On, they didn't have money for livestock. So most likely they have to walk. Imagine full-term labor pains. I don't know how Joseph really pulled that off. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's beyond me. No, no man in the right mind would take on that task, saying, honey, 80 miles, let's go. Um, the prophet Micah, however, centuries prior, he had already prophesied that the Savior would have been born in Bethlehem. And everyone kind of knew that. God used a historical figure like Augustus Caesar, the first Roman emperor, to bring forth his plans for his son. There's always Italians everywhere. You just can't get rid of them. I don't know what it is. Now they're in the dust, mile after mile, excruciating labor pains. They get to their destination, and the baby is ready to come out. Mary must have been a great young woman. She must have remembered the words to the angel when she said, Let it be done to me according to your word. What a humble and strong spirit. And I have to think that just like every young girl, she would have pictured her future life. She would have pictured in her mind and dreamed about her marriage, having kids, being pregnant, raising a family. This is probably the last scenario she would have pictured. So what a strong woman at this young age to be able to be so obedient to the Lord. So the word of the Lord has been now fulfilled through her obedience. A savior who will be a Jew from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David, will be born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem. All of the prophecies and scriptures are coming together now in this moment. Just like we saw on the live nativity scene this morning. All of those prophecies, miles, years apart, coming together in this particular moment. They arrive in Bethlehem, they end up in a stall or a cave. Used, by, for, used for animals because there was no room for them in the inn. Jesus was wrapped in strips of cloth. They looked like bandages wrapped around. Usually they would use those to wrap around young infants to keep their limbs straight. Um, but no family around. It must have been really hard for Mary and for Joseph. Not to have mom there. Not to have auntie. Not to have anybody to help. So here, all you have is a carpenter. I don't know if you've ever met a carpenter. If you've ever shaken at the hand of a carpenter. Calluses, rough skin. Now having to deliver a baby in the dirt with manure, blood everywhere. This is not what you see at the fairgrounds at the petting zoo where everything is nice and pristine and the hay is all stacked nicely and the animals are all clean this is the real deal this is a nasty stall used for animals no upkeeping so that's where Mary now is laying down delivering 
Jesus. Joseph, you're it. You're the guy now. And so she delivers the baby. And it's amazing to me that grace always comes to the lowly and the humble. Jesus calls them the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Nobody's there to witness the incarnation of Christ. God becoming flesh, humbling himself. No audience, no crowd, no applause. However, some people couldn't keep it together. The angels. They had to share the news. And so, a multitude, millions, billions, my personal idea is all of the angels probably came. Why? Because I don't see any angels that will not want to come down and celebrate the biggest and most important time in history. Come down and sing. Glory to God. So the moment that God incarnates is the moment that He decides to come down, humble Himself, to start living a perfect life, sinless life, to become then a perfect sacrifice so you and I can place our trust in Him and have eternal life. And we can skip the excruciating condemnation of hell that is over our shoulders. That's what Christmas is about. That's why the great news. So the angels come down and they announce the news. And the first to hear the news were the shepherds. Now, speaking of nobodies, the shepherds were the outcasts. They were not allowed to even be in close proximity of the city. They were dirty and dishonest. And here they are on the same hills where David watched his father's sheep right outside Bethlehem. Jesus was of the line of David. He will be a king of David's lineage and he will be a shepherd as well. The shepherds were second outcast, only second to the lepers. The lepers were the worst of the worst. Number two, the shepherds. And so they were considered unclean. And because they were considered unclean, they could not be allowed in the temples. They were not allowed to follow any of the ceremonies or Jewish traditions. They couldn't come close to the city unless they were, in this case, close by because they were providing the livestock that would have been used for sacrificial uh, issues in the temple. So any animals that would have been sacrificed, those were only the animals that they were allowed to bring closer to the village or the city. So people could go out to meet them and purchase them. So they're watching sacrificial lambs for the Passover. And it's interesting, even the Passover issue, during the Passover, the lamb was slain. So that the firstborn of the house could live, if you remember Exodus. The lamb was slain so that the firstborn of each house could live when the angel came and killed them all. Now the firstborn son of God is the lamb that dies so that we might live. This is great news. The Savior is born so that he can be the sacrificial lamb. So just like you and I, the shepherds were faced with the challenge. You are now cast. But I got great news for you. And they were offered grace. Grace always comes to the lowly and the humble because God resists the proud. So what did the shepherds do? And you can take some notes if you are interested. They're in your bulletins. Four things real, really fast. The shepherds, number one, received by faith. The shepherds received by faith. Why? They received the news by faith. Maybe they were ignorant. Maybe they didn't know it all. They didn't know any scriptures. Or maybe they had all the info. 
But they received the great news of the Savior coming. An angel came and delivered God's word to them. That's what mattered. Now God's word is recorded. It's called Bible. And God is using the same method. Sunday after Sunday, Bible study after Bible study, God is using messengers to bring the word so that we can be inspired and challenged. He has messengers to teach us and preach us scriptures, announcing the good news just like I'm doing right now. You're in the same position as the shepherds hearing the good news. So becoming a Christian really is as simple as receiving by faith the good news. The message of the angels was great joy. Because unto you was born a Savior, a Savior, yes, that came for the world. Yes, however, came for them personally. This was not simply an announcement to the world, but a challenge for each one of them to accept the Savior personally. If Jesus does not become your Savior, Christmas is nothing but another commercial moment in your year. If Jesus does not become your Savior, Christmas is just a tradition. So the angel said that this will give glory to God, peace on earth, on those in whom He is well pleased. And we know that you can only please God by faith. For without faith it is impossible to please Him. The Bible says that. So you and I today can receive the same news by faith in Him. And the Bible says that those who received Him, He's given them the right to become children of God. So today you can switch from being a church goer on Christmas and Easter to a true child of God and have your life turn around to be the best life ever. But it starts with receiving the word by faith. Maybe you are an outcast like I was. And being an outcast, it's not necessarily an issue of socioeconomic value. You can be an outcast because you're too smart for God. You're too intellectual for Christianity, and so you think. No matter where you are, God can reach you. No matter who you are, there is a penalty on your shoulder like a, there was on mine. A condemnation. That there's nothing in us that can qualify us for a place in eternity unless God provides it and we receive it by faith. And being humble is really just accepting that reality that we need God to provide that holiness that He requires. And the shepherds received the word by faith. Number two, the shepherds responded to that word with obedience. They responded with obedience. Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They could have heard the angels and the great news and not act. I've heard the gospel for years and done nothing with it. I grew up with a father who was a pastor known all over the country of Italy over a denomination of 130 churches. For years, I grew up with the Bible open. I grew up with the pulpit every Sunday. I grew up with Bible studies and cell groups and women's conference and men's breakfast. And, and I've done nothing with it. Until the moment came that I decided that God was humbling me so that I would not only receive by faith, but respond with obedience. And the shepherds did. You and I could hear the best Christmas message, the best good news, and not act on it. But the shepherds did. They responded with obedience. They went, they witnessed, they realized that this was too good to pass. It was real. The Savior was there. And God's word is always true and always gets fulfilled and they saw that. They had hope. And their obedience paid up. Number three. The shepherds now reported the good news. So when they saw it, they made known the saying 
that have been told them concerning this child and all who heard it wonder at the, what the shepherds told them. So the shepherds reported the good news. They saw, they tasted the beauty of the Savior. And the first thing they did, they shared and reported the good news. What a joy they must have felt in that moment. This was too good not to pass along. They must have felt such an amazing moment of joy. I'm a shepherd. I'm a nobody. I'm an outcast. The best excitement in my life is to milk the sheep. It's to brush the sheep's hair. And bam, the Savior came. What a moment. Their life had meaning. Their life had purpose. And it became the most famous eyewitnesses of the birth of Christ in the world and in history. Still today, 2,000 years later, we speak of them. What an impact. Their friends could not believe it. I don't know, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. Do you still report the good news? Are you really still excited about God? I don't know, for me, I, every so often I have to keep myself in check. I remember the moment that I became a, a Christian from a very interesting background that was so far away from God. And I remember the first weeks and months. I couldn't hold on to the news. I had to share the news with anybody that I met. My old friends that left me because now I became a believer. And I wasn't willing to do the things that we used to do together. And I remember the joy and the passion, that evangelistic heart, that moment of a, of a lost outcast that found Christ and found salvation, that now couldn't just share enough of that joy with everybody else. So if you've been a Christian like I have, you have to keep yourself in check. Are you still reporting the great news of Christmas? Are you still reporting that Christ was born and now we have life and redemption and forgiveness and just our life is turned upside down and we just can't handle not to share that. Our last point, the shepherds rejoiced in the Lord. And they returned glorifying, praising God for all they've heard and seen. And it had been told them, true joy comes from the Lord. This event was the true joy for all people. And if you're not a believer... You know how easy it is to see that true joy can feel temporary. And maybe you've tried it. Maybe you're seeking it. You're trying to get satisfaction. And your joy can only be circumstantial. <coughs> you're happy when things are okay. That's fake and phony, and it won't last. True joy comes from the Lord, and it's not circumstantial. True joy is watching in church history martyrs being brutally executed with a smile on their face, knowing that no matter what, Christ was with them until the last minute and did not end well. There's a beautiful Hall of Fame chapter in Hebrews that says, By faith Abraham, by faith Noah, by faith Moses. And it's a Hall of Fame of beautiful characters throughout scriptures that by faith they were blessed and believed and God did some amazing things. However, the chapter does not end with a Hall of Fame. It says what I call the others. At the end of that chapter, you find the others who were cut in half. The world was not worthy of them. They were executed, they were stoned, tortured. And yet, the joy of the Lord was so deep. Because it wasn't based on this life. It wasn't based on anything 
It was based on someone. Christmas became real in the shepherd's heart. This was revolutionary. That moment that the angel came changed and turned their life around because God's word got planted as a seed in their heart. And joy can only be birthed by God's word when you meet God. So the joy of the Lord is the one that comes from understanding that I was lost and now I'm found. I had no purpose and now I do. I had no relationships and now God placed me into a group of people called church and assembly of imperfect sinners. But saved and redeemed like me by the blood of the Lamb. Where we don't have to worry about how we dress and what we do and what we don't do. We don't have to worry about being legalistic and formal or informal. We're just a bunch of sinners redeemed by Christ. And we're all the same. No perfect people allowed anywhere. How amazing that only God could come up with this. So if church for you has become a place where you feel judged and you feel like condemned and you feel like, don't let it be. Because that is not the message of the gospel. The one that is standing up here today is the worst of them all. So that you know if you don't know me. Paul says, I'm the worst sinner. I, I did not deserve this. And yet God called me to be an apostle. Hopefully, if Christianity has failed you, you will give it a second chance. And understand the beauty of a relationship with God and the beauty of being part of a body that can love you, that can love people and love God. And you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in pride and insecurity and, and live off of your insecurities, but in peace and in joy and in confidence in Christ. That is the Christmas message. Receive the word. Respond with obedience. Report it. Share the great news that Christ has come. Let's have a moment to pray, and then we're going to enjoy uh, a great time with the children coming up and ending our service with a great song. Father, we stand before you, and we want to say thank you for the great news of great joy that you have provided for us. Thank you, Lord, that no matter where we are this time of year, for some of us, this is a great time. For some of us... This is one of the worst times of the year because we're alone. But thank you that we're not alone with you. That you have a plan. And no matter how outcast we might feel, no matter where we are with our faith on our spiritual journey, or even if we are alone relationally, that we can have a relationship with you that is above and beyond anything that any relationship can give us. And thank you that you've placed us in a body that can provide those relationships that we so seek and need in our lives. For you made us to be relational. But thank you that Christianity is also about relationship and not about religion. It's about a relationship with you and not based on our works and what we can perform or not. Help us to have a proper understanding this Christmas of what really the meaning of true Christmas really is. Help us to decide right now, in this moment, yes, God, that's me. I'm one of those shepherds, and I'm blown away by the good news. And I want to say yes, that this Christmas will be a new Christmas in my life as a sinner, that I can repent and believe that the Savior of my life, yes, the world, but of my life and my sins has come. Okay, let me take him in and receive him. With gladness and joy, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's have the children come up.